My name is Steve Lillywhite. I'm a music producer. I used to call myself a record producer, but they stopped making records. I don't think CD producer or streaming producer is going to be, it doesn't sound very good. So no, I'm a music producer now, uh, but it was a record producer for the last 35 years. I've been doing it for 40 years. Um, and, uh, and I'm here in Paris at the Abbey Road Institute. My talk is not as technical as maybe some people's because I've really um, learnt that, you know, I've made the best records in the worst studios and the worst records in the best studios. So I can't say that I always use this very expensive microphone, I always use this incredible desk, because I would be lying because, you know, I, I really have made some great music in some shitty places. And I've been in amazing studios like this and it just didn't work. And, but that's what makes, that's the great thing about music in general, is that you can put the best band with the best producer in the best studio and come out with rubbish. And so that X factor, that, that, that magic that I believe in, in a studio, the, the, the belief I have is that you put not the best people together, but you, but, but, but you, you create a, um, a, a situation where great art can be made. And that, that's, how, that's basically my philosophy, I think, of producing, is, is creating the space for creative people. I always say my, my biggest production decision is to agree to do it in the first place. Because once I've agreed to do it, I mean, and I have to deliver. I don't see it as a job. You know, it's a vocation. And a vocation is something that you are, that you must never complain about. I must never complain about what I do in the studio. Because if I do complain, I am not true to that little kid when I was 17 and I walked in here and I looked at this and I said, oh my God, this is Star Trek. You know, and that sense of wonder, that sense of wow. Because this is sort of my church, you know, this is my, my, this is where I believe miracles can happen. You know, that's, that's how I think. I, I, I don't have a religious belief, but I do believe in, because it, it is something that I have proof of. You know, um, I have, I, I, there's no need for faith because I know that given the right elements of success, and I haven't worked out what they are yet because, as I said, I've made the best records in the worst and the worst in the best. But if I can keep looking for that and I occasionally get it, I can make good music. My job was a tape op uh, in the first case. Uh, there's a 24-track um, analog machine. My job was just to press the buttons, record. Um, we had a big orchestra in the studio, big 40-piece orchestra. Um, and, and this was session musicians. And they were being paid from 10 o'clock in the morning until 1 o'clock at lunchtime. Now, the session musician rules are that you can start the last take before 1 o'clock. Two minutes to 1, you can start it. But the moment the clock goes past 1 o'clock, that's it. You can't start another take, otherwise you go into overtime. So anyway, we were rushing, rushing. There was still one song to do, and it was 5-2, three minutes to. OK, we ready? Let's do the last take. OK, go. Record. Orchestra starts playing. They start doing this. And then at two minutes past, one o'clock, the producer presses the button and goes, OK, guys, thank you very much. You can go now. He sits back and says, OK, tea, please. So I... Have my job as well as pressing the buttons is to make the tea. I go and make the tea, bring the tea back, uh, and then go back to my, my station and they say, can you play that last one back? And I press the button and there is no music. Oh my God. At which point the producer, hang on, guys, 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 hold it, hold it, hold it. At that point, 10 minutes it was gone by, the, uh, all the violin players, violin in the case, had gone straight away. The other musicians were like standing around talking, packing up their guitars or drums and all this. So we had, you know, maybe 30 of the 40 or 25 of the 40 there, something like horn players were still there because they are slow anyway. Um, <laughs> so we said that 
So the studio had to pay for the mistake. And, um, and I, this was in 1974, and it was actually a Serge Gainsborough record. So, you know, I, it was, now the trouble was that they didn't have time to re record the strings. They were coming back to Paris and blah, blah, blah. So apparently the song never had the strings on. I think they put a very, very cheap, well, in those days, it was like a some sort of organy thing to play the string line, which was not good. But yes, that was that was my big mistake. The thing is, I've really learned from that. And what I learned is that um, I became complacent. Complacent is, uh, you know what that means, right? Complacent means, I think I can do it. I'm good. Because all I've got to do is two fingers. All I've got to do is press play and record. I was lucky enough that my boss gave me another chance and I didn't make that mistake again. I made a couple of other smaller ones, but you know. Uh, and of course, I've, you know, not every record I've produced has been incredibly successful. So, you know, but, but I do believe that I'm, I'm, re I'm pretty proud of everything I've done. You know, if I go back and listen, and I don't listen very often, um, I, don't, I don't go, you know, I may, maybe some people who produce Britney Spears or, or some things like that, they may go, oh my God, you know, I try, I try to make timeless art. You know, everyone makes art. Art is everywhere. The truly great artists make timeless art. You know, be it Picasso, be it the Chrysler Building in Manhattan, be it the Concord. Beautiful. Doesn't matter when they were made. You know, uh, be it Rumours by Fleetwood Mac. You know, timeless art is something that we all strive for. Definition of a producer, I always say, is the captain of the ship. You know, I find that um, my job is to steer the ship safely to port. Basically, I have to deliver an album for my artist and I have to decorate it and make sure that it's beautiful looking ship when it sails into harbour. Now, we know that the Titanic was a great ship, but it had a bad captain. So um, I take my job very seriously. Uh, I like to think that I can see problems before they appear not through any magic, but just through the fact that I've been in this room since I was 17, you know. So I, I, I feel like it's, I know, I'm, I'm, I'm the king of the control room. You know, I am the, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not the alpha male anywhere else in my life. Actually, I'm more of a follower than a leader, but in the studio, I feel like I, I run the show, but I'm not a bully. I'm not someone who, who, st who stifles, who makes people think they can't be creative. My thing is, I, I'm gently steering, you know, and if it goes off, I bring it back. You know, sometimes I just let it go because it's going. And if I, if I interrupt, you know, too much, I, I, I need to gauge the speed of my artist, whether the artist wants to work quickly or whether they're more like considered and slow. You know, all these things is a producer's job. I hate it when an artist says to me, Steve, I'll do anything you want. I don't know what I want. What I want you to do is to throw 10 ideas at me and I'll go, OK, I'll take that. I take that. Let's do a little bit of this one. Get rid of that. Do that. Come on, let's let's, you know, we work together. But but I don't plant the tree. You know, I'm not a tree planter. I, I grow the tree and I, I steer the ship and all these 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 analogies that I can give but but I'm not a songwriter you know there was lots of, of very great artists for me to work with and I was thinking I could do like maybe five six albums a year and 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 I'm thinking that the artist is only working with me and I'm, I'm thinking well, well why don't they go and work with someone else it's much you know, they can learn from other producers. I'm learning from all these artists. They should be able to learn from other producers as well. So I remember, and it was with U2 for the first time, after the first album, I said, no, you should find someone else. And they go, really? We loved work. I said, okay, okay. So I went back to do the second album, um, which 
in the history of U2, the, their second album wasn't as successful as their first one, for various reasons. Read the book. So at the end of the second album, I said, look, great, you go and do your thing. And they go, yes, yeah, you're right. You know, we need to work with someone else now. And they went and did meetings. They even did a test recording with some guy. And whatever happened, I got a phone call in July saying, Steve, uh, are you busy in September? I went, no. I said, would you like to come and record our third album? And I went, sure. So we went and did the third U2 album, which was actually, um, you know, their biggest album at that point. And at the end of that, you know, we, we both agree, yeah, that's it. Now you need to fly. But, uh, but they... They didn't go for another normal producer. They, you know, they worked with Brian Eno, which was very much not, you know, Brian had never really had a hit record as a producer. You know, he, he had a hit record with Roxy Music as a member of the, uh, you know, but he was a guy who made funny noises on a synthesizer and wore feathers, you know. So, but but he is, he is a very big part of the U2 setup as well because his job is to destroy U2 because he hates guitars and he hates drums uh, so but, but the band want him to destroy U2 then my job is to come and my next job was to come and put it all back together again for how to dismantle an atomic bomb I I had yet a third job which was from the Joshua tree I was added to the to the uh, to the team basically Brian Eno and Daniel Lanois were producing the album Joshua tree and after 18 months, everybody was fried, you know. They said, and the manager was very, very nice. He said, look, when you work with Steve, you did albums in two or three months. He said, why don't you get Steve in? Maybe he can unlock something in your, uh, in your heads. And actually it did work like that. Um, so, so my job then became the last three months of an album. Two months, I would come in. It wasn't just mixing. You know, uh, it was it was mixing. It was helping helping steer the ship safely to port. You know, it was more in in, in terms. It was like a relay race. Um, now a lot of records are made like a relay race. Now you pass the baton to someone else, goes to someone else, goes to someone else. Quite often, the person who is the last person in line gets all the credit. I don't know, but. Um, but in those, you know, this was like a relay race. So that was my job, uh, was adding to the team. Now, and I did that on Actung Baby and also All That You Can't Leave Behind. But when it came to how to dismantle an atomic bomb, the band decided they needed to let the producer go. That means firing him. Um, <laughs> uh, and he was a brilliant producer, made some of my favourite records. I won't say his name, it's not worth it, but... Um, but they, 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 they let him go and I came in and, uh, and took over the whole reins and I brought my own team in. And, um, and I have to say it was, and that was great. And I got my Grammy, I got a couple of Grammys for that. I got producer of the year, which was as good as it gets. You know, well, it's actually producer of the year, non-classical. Why do they say that, non-classical? Why doesn't it just say producer of the year and Producer of the Year, classical. Why is mine Producer of the Year, non-classical? For fuck's sake. Not that I'm bitter. I still have it. When I started, there were many, many studios and only one school in England. Literally only one school, but many studios. Nowadays, there are many schools and only three or four studios. You know, so my advice would always be to someone phone up your local studio and offer to do anything because if you start sweeping the floor you might get a break the the, the assistant hurts his leg his mum's ill we need someone in oh i can do it boom you're there if you're not there you can't you won't ever get in you know so so try and get in somehow that's more difficult now the good news about now is that you can for very little money Get yourself a good Pro Tools system. You can get yourself some speakers, a couple of microphones, and you're set. And a keyboard, you can make your own music. The only trouble is there are thousands of people 
within a square mile of here. <laughs> no, thousands of people in France anyway who are doing that. So how do you do it differently? You must think differently. I always remember a, a great producer called Tony Visconti. I read an interview with him. He said, uh, what you should do with equipment is abuse it rather than use it, you know. And I think that's probably good. You, you know, equipment is normally made by people who are not creative. It's the creative's job to take that equipment and twist it and make it something that is unique to them. You might get a fantastic kid on Pro Tools. You put him in here and say, OK, he wouldn't know what to do. And even in, after a month of learning it, he doesn't feel confident in this. You know, so he won't make such a good job. So be king of your, of your hardware and try and do things that other people don't do. You know, don't, sometimes the best sound is not the right sound, you know, because everyone has the best sound. Everyone has the option of the big Phil Collins drum sound in a box and, you know, You've got Abbey Road plate, and you've got everything. But, you know, no one really knows, and that's the great thing about it. But, but I know that the Abbey Road Institute does give you a very good uh, grounding and gives you a very good entry point, and it gives you the tools. What you do with those tools, it's up to you. But, but here, at least, they give you the tools to make you.